Baroness Jenkin of Kennington. My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, FGM is child abuse, and the Government is clear that we will not tolerate this appalling crime. We have strengthened the law on FGM, and we are very pleased to see the first UK conviction earlier this year. We are also helping communities around the world to end this harmful practice once and for all. My Lords, I am delighted that the, my noble friend confirms that FGM is indeed child abuse. And would she also uh, agree that, that the excuse of cultural practice is uh, no, ex no reason uh, for cutting young girls either in the UK or anywhere else around the world? Well, I totally agree with my noble friend. Cultural practice is often used as um, interchangeably with religious reasons. In fact, the, the whole practice of FGM has nothing to do with uh, religion. And if cultural practices are harmful to children, as this is terribly harmful to girls, not just when it's done, but throughout their whole lives, we, will, we are looking to end it. As a criminal lawyer, I am fully aware of the problems of successful prosecutions, particularly where there are family interests. But the fact that there has only been one successful prosecution must mean that there is something deeply flawed in investigating or prosecuting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Will the Minister convey to the Attorney General my request that he considers inviting the inspectorates of police and CPS for their views? Well, what I think the Noble Lord points out is that actually this is quite a hidden crime. It is hidden. It's, it has various um, protections, if you like, uh, family members not willing to come forward, doctors not willing to come forward. And therefore, although we have had one prosecution, we have had that prosecution. And therefore, I think we need to work on it from now. We've had a lot of um, campaigns in local communities just to highlight the fact that this is uh, an illegal practice uh, and it should not be going on in communities. My Lords, wouldn't a simple and effective step be to make the responsibility for ensuring that children are being effectively taught about the dangers and the illegality of FGM part of the responsibilities of Ofsted. Uh, I met with uh, Nadim Zahawi and Carmen Nirvana last summer, and Mr Zahawi seemed enthusiastic about the idea, but I haven't heard anything since. I wonder if the noble lady of the minister could gently nudge the right honourable gentleman and find out if he actually intends to implement this measure. One thing that the noble lady um, might find helpful is that it's an offence uh, to uh, fail to protect a girl from FGM. And um, since she mentioned um, schools, clearly schools have not only a safeguarding role but a welfare role in regard to children as well. And people, uh, 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 professionals, are now being trained to look out for the signs of wh uh, uh, whether a girl has either gone through FGM, forced marriage, or another form of illegal practice. That in 1985, I took the, fir the first bit of legislation for female circumcision through your Lordship's house and the uh, noble Lord, Lord Glen Arthur, who is here today, was the minister. Uh, this shows how very difficult the situation is, as there have been several bits of legislation since 1985. Well, may, may I commend the noble lady for the work she did back in 1995? I hadn't realised. 1985, even further back. Um, and the noble Lord, uh, my noble friend, Lord Glen Arthur. Um, <laughs> She does point out the difficulties of this. If, you, if, you, if, if people are reluctant to come forward, particularly fa family members, it becomes a very difficult thing to drive out. But we have made a small amount of progress, um, and certainly some of the FGM protection orders that we've introduced have helped to actually uh, stop girls from, um, from going forward to being cut. Does the noble ladies' minister know about the spoon campaign, that's what I call it, where young girls are uh, told about putting a small spoon inside their underwear when they go through any um, uh, checks at, at airports. This alerts the security people 
to the fact that these young girls are frightened and need to be uh, taken care of so that their parents can't take them out of the country to be cut? Well, I must most certainly have heard of the Spoon campaign, and um, I heard the lady who had initiated the Spoon campaign speaking the other week in Manchester. It not only prevents against FGM, but of course forced marriage, um, which uh, is the other benefit of it. It's such a wonderful, simple campaign, and uh, I commend it. My Lords, My Lords uh, the Government is to be congratulated on uh, all the various pieces of legislation that have been taken through. Uh, but, of course, this is much more complex than simply a legal uh, issue, as we've heard. It, that, that's not really seeming to solve the problem. It's clearly a cultural issue, and uh, the Minister has already referred to some of the attempts that have been made to change culture. What uh, efforts are being made to talk to community leaders, some of the key people in those more traditional and sometimes hierarchical communities, to really try to get the cultural change so it becomes an unacceptable practice and something which we really can see addressed? I mean, the right Reverend Prelate goes to the nub of the problem, which it cannot just be so solved by legislation um, alone. And um, certainly we're doing some um, work around the world in terms of um, giving UK aid. But at home, that is where we need to get to for those leaders in their communities to not only see that it's wrong, but articulate that to members of their community that is absolutely not only unacceptable and illegal, but it maims girls for life. When I was the member for Bristol East in another place so quite a long time ago, I did used to work with secondary school head teachers to discuss instances where girls said they were being taken to another country, often a home country for their family, for a long holiday. And the, the school would then do what they could to investigate the purpose of the trip and try to alert the authorities. What work is the government doing with schools? Well, as I outlined to the noble lady, Lady Burt, clearly um, professionals in schools have not got, only got um, a, a duty of care to their children, a safeguarding uh, role, but of course there is now an offence for failing to protect a girl from MGM, uh, FGM. So schools are now trained in spotting various safeguarding issues, including um, uh, uh, the, the, the signs that a girl might be taken away. And actually, the girl isn't necessarily taken away and brought aboard. It can most definitely happen here at home, and we must not um, dismiss that. Um, so we've got all the work to do in terms of, uh, of training our school staff but, but also the work that the Right Reverend Prelate talks about in communities. My Lords, My Lord. My Lords I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, like all uncommenced provisions in the Equality Act 2010, we do keep Section 106 under review. The Government is working to support women and disabled people to participate in politics. This includes the Enable Fund to support disabled candidates in meeting campaigning costs primarily for the English local elections of 2019. Ultimately, political parties are responsible for their candidate selection and should lead the way in improving diverse uh, representation. Many already do so through training and mentor schemes. Well, I also thank the Minister for answering that question. But it is a very similar answer that she gave to me to my written question on September the 17th last year. So what the government is saying is that nothing has changed, that the government has no intention of implementing 106 of the uh, Equalities Act 2010. But would the minister agree with me that to solve a problem, one must have the data to identify it, and that's the reason behind Section 106? So once political parties publish these details, it will show for the first time any action required to improve the diversity of candidates. They can then take a number of measures that they feel necessary, which is what Labour did to increase the number of women candidates. So would the Minister agree with me that there is a need for all parties to improve the diversity of candidates, which eventually would lead to having all our elected institutions looking much more like the people they represent and increasing the diversity, and that is the important thing, if we're going to have our elected institutions 
say, looking like the people they represent. Yeah. Well, I most certainly agree with the noble lady that we do need to improve the diversity of candidates um, so that the, um, the Houses of Parliament, both Houses, uh, look like the people that they represent. Um, and um, in terms of data, she talked about data. Data is really important, um, and I would um, call on all political parties to improve, collate, and report their data, um, and, um, and so that they can not only look to their, themselves, but candidates who might wish to join and represent a political party can also look to that data. My Lords, the women and disabled people and ethnic minorities are woefully underrepresented in our uh, Parliament, our public institutions. But there is a new phenomenon now uh, the disproportionate level of abuse that uh, a lot of women and disabled people, particularly, are um, putting up with on social media. And the Prime Minister was recently quoted as saying that it has become so severe that it's threatening our democracy. Can she say what action has been taken to combat this? Well, I agree with the noble lady and, indeed, my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister. Um, the abuse of some uh, female representatives, and I can think of a few, Luciana Berger, uh, uh, to name one, is so severe that I'm surprised some of them are actually still in Parliament. It has been so bad for them. Um, I think it is absolutely up to the leadership of political parties, not just to recognise the abuse, but to deal with it and deal with it promptly. That is the only way that we are going to drive out some of the abuse that we're seeing. My Lords, my Lords uh, would the noble lady, the Minister, agree with me that one of the first challenges is to instil in people who might have disabilities or feel themselves in some other way to be disadvantaged the confidence to recognise the potential that they have for contributing and that this needs to start early. And uh, could I commend to her in that regard the work of Chicken Shed in North London which mm. works through theatre practice to give young people with a very wide range of abilities an enormous amount of confidence and an ability to see themselves as the leaders of the future. Well, I thank the noble lady for commending me to Chicken Shed. I will certainly uh, look into it. Um, she makes a really good point about disabled people knowing their ability and the chances um, and, and the opportunities open to them in life, no matter what they might wish to do. And I'm very pleased to see that certainly on the media now we have more disabled uh, rec representation of people uh, in dramas and um, uh, on television and in film, of course. But, um, yeah, disabled people should know, just like the rest of us know, that nothing need to hold them back. My Lords, I, um, I'd like to return to the noble lady's question about Section 106. And... Uh, Without legislation, it's very without enacting the, the legislation, it's very hard for those who are um, concerned about diversity to hold political parties to account. And I ask my noble friend again what it is that the government is uh, so anxious, uh, why they're so anxious to not enact the, uh, the legislation. Well, I think um, what uh, the issue is that. Um, the government feels that all political parties actually should be responsible for including uh, diversity, um, for, for being diverse and inclusive uh, when they select and elect their candidates. We have given um, a, a, a £250,000 fund, the Enable Fund, um, which will help for this year, but we then feel that actually individual political parties should show leadership in this area. The Minister said quite rightly that both Houses should represent the country as a whole more effectively. Is she aware that half of the members of this House live in London? What does she suggest might be done to make it more easy for uh, a better representation from other parts of the country in this chamber? Well, I thank the noble lord um, for that, and I'm sure he doesn't live in London. I'm sure he lives in, in Scotland, and I'm one of the other half who also don't live in London uh, quite deliberately because I think we do need to actually look outside of London when we, when we think about the northern powerhouse, when we think about unemployment opportunities. It, it, London is a bubble unto itself, and actually for the other re regions to pay, play their part uh, in the economy and otherwise is very, very important. 
Baroness Faulkner of Margaret My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. Uh, my Lords, equality and diversity in higher education is a priority for this Government. On October the 11th, 2018, the Prime Minister set out her expectation that more must be done to create a workforce that is representative of British society today. As part of the race disparity audit, Government has asked higher education providers to tackle ethnic disparities in their workforce using tools such as the Race Equality Charter and the Race at Work Charter. I thank the Noble Lord for that very helpful reply, and I unequivocally uphold university autonomy and independence. But he knows that the latest data shows that of 19,000 UK university professors, only 25 are black women. This is reflected across senior roles in the Russell Group. Would he accept that institutions receiving those public funds must go beyond the Race Equality Charter and must uphold race equality law? So in the absence of a regulator for this aspect of HE, will he look at collaborating with the Higher Education Research and Funding Councils to see whether we can get more accurate data about what's holding back recruitment, retention and promotion in this sector? Well, can I start by applauding the work that the Noble Baroness uh, continues to do in this particular field? Um, and I do acknowledge uh, that the figures are of concern, and that is why, in addition to the October announcement that I just mentioned, on February the 1st, the Government announced measures to tackle ethnic disparities in higher education, specifically in relation to the recruitment and progression opportunities for ethnic minority acad uh, academics. And the Noble Baroness may know that Karen Blackett is the Government's Race at Work champion and she'll be working at institutions, including universities, to address inequality by taking practical steps, such as introducing apprenticeships and offering mentorships. Does my noble friend agree that universities are independent institutions and that that independence is an important ingredient in creating the prestige that British universities enjoy globally? Consequently, does my noble friend agree that universities should not have a responsibility to deploy effective recruitment procedures? Well, there is a balance, uh, uh, my Lords, and uh, I thank the Noble Lord for making that point because this House took through the autonomy for institutions during the passage of the Higher Education and Research Act. So autonomy is important. On the other hand, the Office for Students has a statutory duty to protect the academic freedom of English higher education providers. Uh, so they have their uh, duty to uh, put some pressure on the universities, but universities equally must be allowed to make the decisions themselves as to who they employ and how much they're paid. My Lords, the, the death of black Asian uh, minority ethnic people, particularly women it's in senior positions in Russell Group universities, is shocking, but it's not surprising because surely it's a symptom of the fact that so few BAME uh, students went to those universities over the years, because academics uh, today uh, who have been at those universities themselves tend to dominate the senior positions uh, at, at Russell Group universities. They should surely adopt appointments policies that begin to uh, deal with underrepresentation in the short term. And I welcome the, the noble Viscount, the Minister, saying he's going to refer this matter to, to Karen Blackett for her to, to, to look at. But isn't it the case that the attempts by universities to um, widen student participation uh, at the leading university, I should say, uh, have proved to be quite inadequate? And shouldn't the Minister now uh, a, advise the Office for Students as a regulator to bring greater pressure on Russell Group universities to make sure that their admissions policies are fit for purpose? Well, the question is, is mainly focused on staff and the workforce, and there is uh, more to be done to create a workforce that is representative of British society today, particularly amongst universities. And it's very important that universities do, as the Noble Lord was alluding to, um, set, up, set up a pipeline generally, so that in, to encourage um, BME uh, students to come in and go on to do some research and then go on to become academics, and that is a, a, a genuine focus of, of this government. Isn't it in the interest of universities to ensure that they are attractive to the whole range of young people who have the ability to benefit from universities, irrespective of their colour or their background or their religion? And therefore, isn't it in the interest of the universities to ensure that they are seen as a welcoming place for people who are uh, of a different uh, colour uh, or background and make sure that they have a range of academic staff that re reflect that range of interests. 
I think the noble lord makes a very good point. I think it's very important that uh, wherever universities are based, that they reflect the area that they're in, but equally that they adopt the policies that the noble lord uh, has, 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 has made. Um, so I think that um, there is more work to be done, and universities uh, know this, and the pressure is being put on them by the Office for Students. My Lord, since the Russell Group is referred to in the question and is frequently uh, an object of uh, discussion in relation to higher education policy generally, uh, and much referred to, I think, by the government uh, as well, uh, can the Minister tell the House precisely what characteristics are required in order for universities to be members of the Russell Group, which I understand is a self-selecting group, but maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, and could, she, could he also uh, explain to the House how the views of the Russell Group differ from other uh, groups in the uh, groupings of universities in the university sector? Well, it is a very good question from the Noble Lord, because I asked that very question as to what the definitions are for the Russell Group University uh, for those that are part of it, and uh, the rest of the universities in the UK, and th there, is, there isn't one actually. But I do acknowledge the point that the uh, House has made, which is of the total academic staff workforce at Russell Group Universities for 2017 to 18. 11 per cent were male and professors, and 3 per cent were female and professors. There is more work to be done to uh, uh, put some pressure on the Russell Group Universities. Share an interest as a former Russell Group University teacher. Uh, with, uh, and, uh, I, is not the problem for particularly women and women from ethnic minorities not the undergraduate recruitment, but getting through the graduate student and postdoc stage? And would not the government, in collaboration with Hefke, care to look at the adequate funding for people through that difficult process, as well as the informal discrimination, which I have certainly seen as a, as a graduate student supervisor from time to time, towards young women uh, as opposed to young men. The Noble Lord is right. Uh, it's not so much Hefke now, but I think it should be a joint collaboration between the Office for Students and for Universities UK and for UCU and various other bodies to work together to make some progress in this area. Interest as a former Chancellor of a non-Russell Group University, and, and further, to, uh, further to my noble friend's point, is there a difference between uh, the amount of uh, people employed within the non-Russell Group compared with in the Russell Group itself? Is there, is there actually a difference, or is this a problem that goes across all universities? Uh, I think it is a problem that uh, is uh, you know, across all universities. Uh, there are some figures here which I could uh, spend some ages going into, but there, it is a problem across all universities, and more work needs to be done, which I've already said. Baroness Heyman. I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lord, my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, visited Yemen last weekend to push for progress, becoming the first Western Foreign Minister to visit Yemen since the conflict began. This conflict has exacerbated the vulnerabilities faced by women and girls. Gender-based violence has increased and gender inequalities become further entrenched, and the United Kingdom has provided support to over 1,700 victims of gender-based violence since 2017. However, it is a shared opinion by all I know in this House. Only by securing peace can the position of women and girls be substantively Im be improved. My Lords, I thank the Noble Order Minister for that response and the recognition it can of the situation of women in Yemen, and I draw the House's attention to my interests as set out in the register. Even before the war, Yemen was rated as the worst place in the world to be a woman. Since then, uh, in the desperate humanitarian crisis that has occurred, women and girls, and of course their children, have indeed suffered disproportionately, with the latest report from the International Rescue Committee showing a 63 per cent increase in incidents of rape, of gender-based violence, and of forced and early marriage in the last four years. So does the Minister accept that humanitarian efforts do need to prioritise the needs of women and girls, and of course their children, uh, in future to look to protect them, and also that women need to be involved as equal partners in discussions and peace going forward? In answer to both questions, short answer is yes. And I think, just to put this into context, in Yemen specifically, 
in terms of some of our programme, particularly those being led by DFID. There's £39 million allocated on issues of forced marriage, for example, of which Yemen is one of the priority countries. And specifically on this issue of forced marriage, there's been 6,000 girls directly impacted who have been assisted through both counselling and health provision in this particular regard. And there's a further 65,000 where we have done further outreach work as far as is possible to ensure the issue of early marriage is also addressed. In terms of the issue of peacekeeping, absolutely, and that's why the Government has committed internationally, uh, more recently in the Commonwealth context, to women peacemaking uh, uh, networks. And in that regard, as we approach International Women's Day, I think it's important. There's emphasis at the UN as well as here and elsewhere in the world on the importance of women in conflict resolution. The IRC report uh, did show horrific examples and certainly uh, a series of recommendations. One in particular is access, humanitarian uh, access, and particularly where health centres and hospitals that have been providing support to women and girls who have been subject to gender-based violence. Uh, access to them has been restricted, they have been bombed and damaged. Can the Noble Lord, the Minister, tell us exactly what the Government is doing uh, on all sides to ensure that there is proper humanitarian access? Well, first of all, I thank the Noble Lord. Uh, he and I have spent a fair bit of time on this issue and we will continue to work together because I think we are very much at one on this. The, my right hon. Friend's recent visit again highlighted the importance of peace, supporting the efforts through the UN, including the UN resolution that has been passed. And there are three elements to this. One is about ensuring humanitarian relief. And current figures show that whilst the reports of Hodeida and Salif remain open, there is still a big issue in terms of distributing that aid further. The second is about fuel supplies. There's about 86 per cent of the requirements of Yemen that have been met last month. However, again, it's about getting those fuel supplies out. Those are the basic fundamentals. On the issue of girls and women and protection and health centres, of course, that was a priority which the uh, Foreign Secretary raised with both sides, including representatives of the Houthi community, to ensure that as we address the fundamentals of addressing food and humanitarian aid, the issues of protection for girls, particularly from child marriage and forced marriage, is also high up the agenda. Lords, would the noble lord, wearing his hat as the Human Rights Minister, be aware of the recent report by the University Network for Human Rights, which shows that the US and, U and British arms were used in 200 unlawful bombings recently, and that most of the casualties were women and children? So would he not like to consider more prohibitions on the use of the arms that we are selling Saudi Arabia in, in their pursuit of this ghastly war in Yemen? Well, so first of all, the noble lady will be aware that the United Kingdom adopts a very stringent uh, rules system, which is both across the EU as well as a national code on any military assistance. And we remind any country that, that we conduct arms sales or support to of those particular rules. And I can assure the noble lady we review this in the context of the conflict in Yemen uh, on a regular basis. She's right to raise these particular issues. But our military assistance in terms of support that we provide, for example, to Saudi Arabia is specifically on issues of training, particularly on the important issue of international humanitarian law. And we use every opportunity to remind all our allies of those important prior. My lords. However, does not seem to be working. We have these people in Saudi Arabia advising how they should use weapons that we've sold them. We have just released statistics showing how amazingly careful the Royal Air Force has been over using its weapons to not kill civilians, and yet that is not happening in Yemen. Why are we not teaching them how to use these things without causing mass civilian casualties? Well, the noble lord will know from his own experience teaching doesn't happen in one day. It's a consistent effort over a period of time. And it is important that in any interventions around the world, where the United Kingdom is giving support in terms of military assistance on training of international humanitarian law, anyone who engages does require that training over a period of time. I take on board the challenge that he's presented, but also the tragic nature of the Yemen conflict. And that's why the Foreign Secretary has pushed again that the only way we're going to guarantee the civilian casualties that we have seen over a period of time from not having the impact on the communities, on women and girls, is through a political settlement. And that's why he was in the region pushing it, not just with Yemen, but also with the likes of the Emiratis and the Saudi, Saudi government as well. My Lords, can my noble friend, the Minister, tell us, are we managing to get support 
to women's organisations on the ground and women human rights defenders in Yemen? Well, as I've already said in response to my, the noble Lord, Lord Collins, I think the challenge remains whilst humanitarian assistance is getting through. In terms of the safety and security of those supplies further around the country, that does re, um, present a, a real and present challenge. I think we are looking to not just identify but ensure the safety of agencies. But in this regard, our main focus has been UN agencies on the ground to ensure their protection so they can distribute aid and provide the protection that my noble friend has raised.